And uh, good morning. This is Leo Gilling on the Leo Gilling Show. Good morning. It's a great Saturday morning right here over in Florida. I mean, a great Saturday morning. I mean, one great Saturday morning. Really, really good. The the um the weather seems very very clear. Nice um sunlight bursting, and I am loving today. I am loving today, not just for the sunlight, nor for the beautiful day, but because today I have Dr. Simon Alonso Clark again. Uh, he started a conversation last week that caused a lot of eruption among people who are sharpites and who are and people who are non sharpites. So it's really good to have you back on the show again, Dr. Clark, to continue the fantabulous stories that you told that you uh, that you engaged with us last week. Thank you so much for joining the show. Good morning to you. Uh, good morning, very glad to be back. <laughs> I couldn't wait. I got very excited when I saw the names of so many people from some job that I had not heard from for 40 years. <laughs> One of the persons that excited me was Dr. Joy Mighty. Yes. Uh, you guys found her. Yes. And, you know, herself and people like Dr. Cecile Walden and myself were like brothers and sisters. Yeah. At some job, you know. Oh, my gosh. Yes, she was. Oh, my gosh. She was one of those um, lecturers that everybody on the campus loved. <laughs> She was yes, special from Guyana. Diana. I think she was making her before she married Jimmy, my friend, a high oh. jumper. Her husband was all schools Jamaican high jumper. Oh, okay. Yes. I didn't know that. Okay. That's I, see, I, I see him going right over the pole right now. <laughs> <laughs> she okay, so that, she was not into athletics. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> Last time I saw her was in 199 no it was in 2005 when we had the first reunion she came from wherever she was and joined us yes. at the first reunion uh, on, on, on the campus yes yes great well it's good to see you again and um and i know that last week we we sh you shared some some um some information that you wanted to to correct for us so before we start the the, the show i want you to go back into Paula left Paula fear uh, um, and correct what what I thought you said because I got very excited <laughs> yeah okay said Paulo Freire Freire okay I think we're having a little problem who was a Brazilian yeah. editor and then he was going on to the Michael afterwards. He was outstanding for that publication, the, uh, the uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which a number of you, I think, yes. were, were given and required reading. Yes, yes. And therefore, I got, I got to know him very well, okay? <laughs> but I was telling you about him and then sort of mentioned the name Jean Piaget. <laughs> so at the beginning of the conversation, I said Jean Piaget, but Jean Piaget was well before my time. <laughs> and I never met him, but I'm going to tell you, in the brain is a way of doing some things because I was, I'm going to tell you later how I became connected with his legacy. Okay. Now, um, Jean, Jean Piaget, as you know, you, had to, you all had to study. He was from Switzerland, and he was the first Swiss director of the International Bureau of Education in Switzerland, okay. and he did all the fantastic things in child development, which you studied. Yes, we studied. Okay. Um, but he died in, he died in, in August, in September 1980. So that was well before we were talking. And the oh. episode with uh, our Brazilian educator, um, Paulo. He died in 1997. Oh. Paulo Freire. Okay. Okay. So I did. Mention his name towards him, but just a clear to with everybody. No, 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 I wasn't around <laughs> when he was around. But let me tell you what it was. Many, many years afterwards, in 1998 or 1999, UNESCO appointed me to the board of the International Bureau of Education in Geneva, where Piaget was director years ago. Oh. Okay, I mean, when he entered, there was a big thing. And not only that, 
I became a vice president of the International Bureau of Education for Latin America and the Caribbean, and also the chairman of their administrative uh, commission. So that was my connection with Piaget, but never <laughs> naturally met him in life. But, but Paulo Ferre, yes. I did meet Paulo Ferre at the International Conference on Adult Education and Literacy at University of Pennsylvania, where he was a guest speaker, and I was a sort of uh, discussion leader afterwards. Yes, so, so I hope so I'm clear that. So you know, you, this morning I was, when I, after I sent out my first text, right, I, I, uh, one of the responses that I got was from um, Professor, um, Professor Neville Yung, who spoke, oh, my friend, great mathematician. <laughs> you spoke very highly of you. You said you guys wrote no, a lot of projects. Neville is in a class by himself. <laughs> we hope we can produce some more Neville's fantastic human <laughs> being. <laughs> you know, he, he, he's one of those catalysts. You know, he's one of those um, fathers of the diaspora movement. In uh, you know, uh, he helped to 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 create avenues for us to be able to speak back to Jamaica and develop interventions and so forth. He's great. I am very happy, and I'm not surprised. He's that kind of human being. Both himself and his wife have been very fantastic people and very strong graduates of the Michael. Never knew that. <laughs> he's the current, I think he's the current chairman of the board, isn't he? Or he's always he on the board. Kind of, yes. <laughs> Neville, fantastic guy. I've got a great admiration for him. All right, great, great. Yeah. All right, so let's get into it. It's, you know, I want to first um, go ahead and say uh, welcome to the Sharpites who are, who are watching. I'm sure they would want me to acknowledge that they are online and watching you. <laughs> All of the Sharpites from 1975 until, until today, um, you know, and the persons, especially the, especially the ones who who you um, taught or, or you had a, a first-hand experience with between 1975 and 1985? Was that, is, that, is that when you taught that, Sam Sharp? That's the first time years, yes. Yes, yeah, so uh, big ups to all of those guys who, who, um, who attended Sam Sharp during those, th those years. I wanted to, to bring up, because I was talking to you earlier this week, and you talked about Bob Marley. Um, you're meeting Bob Marley. You didn't, tell, you didn't tell me exactly where you met Bob Marley and the discussion that you had. You, you went, kind of went around and talked about um, uh, his wife, who's Rita Marley. But um, can, can you remind me? I knew her a lot better. Yes. Yeah, okay. I knew, okay. I, knew, I, knew, I knew his wife, Rita, far better than I knew him. I must have uh, met him face to face about once or twice, okay? Okay. But we okay. spoke on the phone a couple of times when we, the Germans who came to stay at Sam Sharp wanted to see him. So yes. we had to arrange a tour from Montego Bay to Kingston for every single group that came from West Germany every three weeks. <laughs> and so Bob got to know them better than I did, you know what I mean? <laughs> but Rita, I knew very well, simply because she was a little young miss in the Sunday school that my father, when he retired from Panama, right. my father started at Friendship Park Road over beyond Trenchtown. Ah. And she coached her in singing, my dad. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. That was a great, great, great um, uh, pick up there. And, 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 and let me get into some other things that you did because I read your bio, so impressive. Oh my gosh, so impressive. I looked at, and I'm going to dig into something that probably um, remind you of the silver and the, and, and the bronze. Uh, I want you to explain this. I noticed that in your bio, you, you, st you started the Boys, you, the boys brigade, brigade, the All Saints, YMCA, the YMCA Montego Bay, you, or you have had relationships in that regard. Um, Moby Boys Club, and the boys clean up at George Park. You, you remember all of those? I, I notice there's heavy- The George Park thing, I have to tell you a little more. Yeah. Yes, yes. But what I want to talk about is what, what was going on during those era, right? Because I know that there's heavy in boys and there wasn't a lot of girls in the social space and the community space. And that's why probably it was heavy here. Tell me about 
how it is what it was back in Jamaica, right? Um, and and the focus on boys uh, versus today, which there's a, a, a more focus. Uh, you know, they were forced pretty much more, more focus on on women development of the women and 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 and, and motherhood and and so forth and, and so forth and and how it is or how it was back in the sixties and fifties uh, with boys development and why. I think way back then the girls and young ladies had better coverage in respect to leadership. You had the YWCA. I remember over in Trenchtown, they converted the Trenchtown market, just opposite to where the whole Ambassador Theater used to be, yes. into a young girls YWCA center, yes. where all the young girls and ladies from that area came and joined in the clubs. Mm. The Jonestown Baptist Church had a Tuesday evening Bible study around yeah. there. I never forget that. Yes. There was a lot of activity involving girls, but not so much for boys. We had the Boy Scouts movement. You had the Boys Brigade. I myself was a member of the Boys Brigade. Right, right. I was a captain. <laughs> Strange enough, I was a captain of the Boys Brigade in South Lamar. And so there was this great focus on boys. Right. When we were in high school in the sixth form, the headmasters of the Kingston Seconders of the Kingston High Schools got together and said, we have to do something beyond the classroom for our young boys and men, because very soon they're leaving. Mm -hmm. And so people like Wesley Powell of Excelsior, you had um, Harvey Enever of Jamaica College, um, Murray White from Calabar, and several others who decided that the best thing to do was to get those boys, us as mm -hmm. young men, young boys, involved in the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, mm -hmm. to learn some basic skills in youth leadership. Mm -hmm. And so we were all recruited from the different schools. And in many times, many times we stayed at the YMCA, which was then at 76 Hanover Street. The Ministry wow. of Labor has one of his offices there now. Okay. And we used to spend weekends there doing training courses. And so when the summer came, we were trained to be leaders for young boys drawn from the inner city of Kingston. Okay. They needed help. There was no, no leaders. So we provided the first, uh, the first group of leaders for those young men. Um. It was wonderful. I should mention that we were very much also associated with Boys Town. Remember oh. Boys Town? Was yes, I do. Yes. Sherlock. Yes, you shall start. And that Boys Town started at Jonestown Baptist Church on Price Street in oh. Jonestown with the Reverend okay. William Sawyer. Uh -huh. Tell a story. Okay. Boys came on and problems with the church because they started to break up all the windows by playing football and cricket in the, in the churchyard. And the members were not impressed at all and wanted the minister to get rid of them. <laughs> and so the minister persuaded that that is something and we can understand it, but these boys need help. Yes. And call Father Sherlock, as he used to be called then, and they decided that they would bring the boys together and they told the boys the difficulty. And the boys said, okay, sir, we will. They were not doing it maliciously, you know, but you're right. playing a game of football. Many times, like me, I couldn't necessarily control a shot. <laughs> you probably, you know. And so, anyhow, Boys Town was moved from Price Street, Jonestown, to where it is now at Collis Smith Drive. Okay, in, yes. yes. In, 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 in uh, West Kingston there, in Trenchtown. Turned out some outstanding people. So the YMCA also became interested in Boys Town as well. Because Father Hugh Sherlock, the Reverend Dr. Sherlock, who, by the way, wrote the road words of the national anthem, I'm going to talk about that for uh, two. Yes, he, um, Father Sherlock was a very keen member. As a matter of fact, played an excellent game of football for the YMCA. Football. Oh. The YMCA had one of the best teams of both football and cricket. Father yes. Sherlock played on the football team. And okay. he played cricket too, but his, his strength was in football, I gather. Okay, okay, okay. And speaking of Hugh Sherlock and the independence, the, not the, uh, the, the, um, the anthem, the national anthem, you also spent some time carving out something 
on on independence. I want to know about how what was the the whole vibes like around independence. One, what was your insertion? Because you 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 were um, brought to the Montego Bay Library for a particular a particular um, task. Tell us about the task and tell us about how that fit into the broader goal to become independent. Okay, one of the first things I should remember, those of us who were then university students of the University College of the West Indies, <laughs> when, I'm at, when I'm articulated with a group, small group of my colleagues from the rest of the Caribbean, um, it was interesting that the University College was well, only seven years old, <laughs> you know, oh. brand new institution. Okay. But at simultaneously with what was developing there, was this strong sense of Caribbean nationalism. Yes. I stopped saying that I was either Panamanian or Jamaican. Yeah. I was telling everybody, everybody that I was West Indian. Uh, and we all did it. Yeah. We were very excited about being part of this larger national entity. Oh, is that so right? when we graduated, when we graduated, we came into the world with this strong sense a purpose that was before independence, just, yep. just around about a little yep. before independence because independence is 1962. Okay, yeah, yep. and uh, we were very, very strong on all of this. I should remember that when I came to Montego Bay, one of my first assignments was to chair a committee of residents um, who would look at the draft of the Jamaica Constitution. Mm -hmm and to send back comments to a central national committee in Kingston about any ideas we would suggest need to be changed or need to be added. So we went through, as youngsters, the entire constitution, line by line. Wow. I cannot say that any of the recommendations that we made were accepted. <laughs> One or two people were very cynical. But sure, they agree with all of this. Uh, they're only going through the motions. <laughs> but the fact that we went through the constitution gave us yes. a sense of knowledge of what it was all about and what a constitution was. Yes. yes. And um, it benefited us a lot. Of the, I should tell you another story about independence, the kind of vibe it created in a lot of us. I was then the first secretary or director of the Montego Bay YMCA. I came mm -hmm. down to start the Montego Bay YMCA at the same premises where the Calvary Baptist Church now is. Yes. And it was in 1964 we moved the Y from where it is at um, 13 Humber Avenue up to the foot of the hill that you know that foot of the hill yes, there. Right, yes, yes. The it's still mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. We got a letter from the parish council to say, look, um, we are having a first independent parade in Montego Bay and we're inviting the YMCA to put on a float. <laughs> and we were very excited about this invitation. But when we checked it out, it was when it cost about 60 or 70 pounds, something like that. And we couldn't afford it as a group of young men. <laughs> so I remember writing back to the secretary, where well, was the secretary then? Can't remember. To say that we, we cannot afford to do this, but we promise to do some bit of work for Montego Bay in honor of independence. Okay. And I made a very silly recommendation of saying, like that wanted us to paint up the, 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 the gutters with white light. <laughs> Why is it the way I went to clean on that? <laughs> so I said, like, we could, couldn't we not paint up the walls of Jared Park? One side of Jared Park, nearest Cottage Road, where, where some, well, there was a very tall wall. It's still there. Yes, I know they were. Very drab. Yes. Yeah, it's very, very drab, very drab. And I made the mistake of saying, we would like to paint up the walls in the new colors of Jamaica. But wow. when I went and checked and what did call, I was about to write to the secretary and said, oh, can we do something else? Before <laughs> I could say that, a van backed up at the Y <laughs> with drums of paint, wow. paint brushes. I'm spray equipment for us. They were so excited that we were going to do this. Okay. Get started. And I am in trouble now, but I can't turn back. You know <laughs> what I did? I went to the first set of boys I went to, the Cornell College boys, because they were close yes. to me. Right. I taught them the day and they came to the YMCA in the evening. People like Donald Toppin, 
went on to Adyar afterwards. Wadamara went on to Air Jamaica and a whole lot of others. I came to say, guys, I'm in trouble, but we need to do this. We need to start a group of youngsters that will paint up the walls of Jad Park in the red, golden, in the in a green, black, green color. <laughs> yes. And, I know them boys and say, I thought they were going to say, but this, they became very excited. And so I said, but we can't do it alone. So I decided to invite as many of the schools around okay. as possible to join. Great idea, that's good. So I went to the Montego Bay Boys School, which was down the road. Mr. Hewling was then the headmaster. Hewling. The group. This is a prime school. Yes. Montego Bay High School, the boys were not too keen because what, them, what those girls can do. <laughs> that was their attitude, you know. Them yes. And um, one school that was very good was the uh, Harrison Memorial High School, the Seventh Day Adventist School. Because they're right next door. The road. And they're right next door. Right, right. And they got there. And it got, we went Mount Alvernia girls. I said, what are you girls? But anyhow, we got started. And therefore, the boys decided, well, the girls will be responsible for making lemonade and Russian <laughs> sandwiches for us while we painted. The girls protested. <laughs> they want to paint we, we don't come here to make any sandwiches for you guys. <laughs> and so we decided to move them into a squad by themselves. Okay. Boy, when those young ladies took off, the boys were hard put to, to keep up with them in yes. painting. Yes, yes, yes. And we had something like about five days to complete it because independence was going to be on the 6th of August. And we didn't have very much time. Wow. And we would start and go right down. And now, in the end of the holiday, you know, people came out. Yes. We go right down until sunset. And I can never forget on the evening of the 5th of August, 1962, we finished. Oh. It was such a beautiful sight. The 5th of August, the following day was going to be the, the <laughs> St. James Western Jamaica celebration of Jamaica's independence. And I remember I was so inspired. I, I got up very early in the morning. I used to live at the Y, which was where Calvary is now, right behind Jad Park. Yes, yes. So I used to get up in the mornings and jog around there. And so this morning, the grass was beautifully cut by the parish council. Beautiful. Uh -huh. I was jogging bare feet. Uh -huh. No shoes, no boogers, nothing. Have you ever felt the grunge and the massage <laughs> of freshly <laughs> on yes. their feet? <laughs> it was a wonderful feeling. <laughs> and I went around about twice. And then I came across the road and went into my little room at the Y and I penned these words. I don't remember all of them. We salute our native land. <laughs> That's so the nice. food and the voice we yields. Oh my we God. strive with our zinnius toil to plow and plant the fields. Oh. We hear the hum, the engines roar, the black clouds <laughs> rise on high, the slender reed was crushed and ground, sugar cane, you know. The great red earth was baked with fire, bauxite. What does it matter, the color of the skin? Brothers and sisters, are we all? Fathered by one God, one spirit breathes through all. And then, again, I always take it to school. When the boys said, we love these things. So can we get a copy? Those boys in school at Cornwall were my inspiration too, you know, and why. When you did something good, they tell you. If it's not so good, they say, that's a happy <laughs> so They would tell you the truth. Yes. And so they were my sounding board, and I did that. I should, I don't want to rush to this too. When Churchill died, I was teaching a group of boys in the fifth form literature. Them boys are interested in literature. <laughs> they always think that was girl stuff. You know, anyway, <laughs> trying to get them interested. And I was trying to say many times when some very great thing happened, somebody would pen the words of literature it's to a commemorate yes. great events. So Churchill had died. And, and, and I, I really think that 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 what you just said about that independence 
uh, you know, creating that that kind of energy around independence. I hope you have it written down somewhere because that's that is epic. I have, in fact, I have done the first draft of my memoirs, and it's in there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yes, uh, you, here's something important, Dr. Clark. You said you asked me, have, have I ever felt the you know the, the massaging of the feet by the grass, you know, running yeah. Yes, two yeah. feet. All right. But you also mentioned booger. I don't think you know today's people who are listening to us. Uh, understand the word booger. So tell us what booger is. Not that thing that came out, came out of the nose. Tell us what, what a booger is. A booger was supposed to be a crepe, a crepe. soul, rubber soul suit, which was not <laughs> known to have a great reputation, especially in the boarding school <laughs> after dark when boys had come up from the plane. It had an odor which was not very inviting. <laughs> and so I don't know. The, I can't tell you where the name boogers came from, but you can just imagine the term boogers. And anything that sounds like boogers, that is it. <laughs> Must be bad. <laughs> that is it. That is it. I, I, to... I went on their feet because the grass was so beautifully cut. The, the, the other parts council did a fantastic job, man. And I came back and wrote those words. But I was telling you about the other thing that I did when Churchill died. Yes. I said, boy, I got to show them guys what I mean about the value of literature and poetry and how it can be used in a special situation. So, and you know, the Gleaner had some excellent coverage. He, he was in a coma for about 10 days before he died. You won't remember that, but we all read it every day. Yes. I read it every day. And then he finally slipped away. That's Churchill. Mm -hmm. I remember him visiting Jamaica and I was standing at the curb of, of uh, Church Street and North Street when he came up in an open car. And we all, we didn't know the negative sides of him, you know, but we were kids and we all heard about this great war hero. But I went and penned some more words, oh. especially for the class, you know. And uh, this is what, I can't remember all of it, but I'll give a little summary. Yes. Did, 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 da was the title of it. And while did, 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 da, did, 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 da is a Morse code for the letter V. When I was doing radio communications, I had to learn Morse code to pass the exam. I'm telling you, we all have to learn it. But did, 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 da meant V. And Churchill, when he traveled through Kingston, had his fingers like this. He didn't have, it wasn't a Jamaican political significance. Yes. Because at the end of the war, this was a V meaning victory. Victory, yes. The allies had won the war. Yes. And um, what happened was that Beethoven, the great German composer, had composed a, a musical composition, Symphony Number no. 5 in C minor. Oh. And the rhythm was ta da da ta Ta -da -da -ta -ta -ta. Oh my gosh! And that was me. That was a V. That's so oh. At the end of the war, that symphony was played all over the world in a local station. Da -da -da -da. And, yeah, da 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 da. ZQI, I think, was on was in Jamaica at the time. That was the predecessor of RGR, and that was it. Da 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 da. And so I tried to use that in putting this poem together. Oh my God! Oh my God! That's a great warrior. Oh my God! I never even thought about. I didn't even think about Beethoven's um, da 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 at being. I didn't know. You, you, oh my God! Morse code for V. The letter V. Victory. Every letter of the alphabet had a combination of dots and dashes. Yes. And it was that. V, okay. No. So, so, so I, did, I wrote did it down. Yes. The oh. aged warrior stroke stricken laid. Oh. He had a stroke, you know. Yes. Um, ten times rose up the sun on high. Ten times did it said he was in a coma for ten 
this. So I, instead of saying it was in a coma for 10 days, I said 10 times did the sun rise up on high. Yes. And times, 10 times it said air before. Yeah. The last warm dregs of the living sap, the richest of Saxon blood made empty its vessel stout. Oh, oh my gosh. His dead would say, is that great hero now dead? Are those two fingers now closed? Yeah. Remember the two fingers that were used for the V? Proclaiming, and I can't remember all of it. Yes, sir. The victory was, divine. The, the victory divine. The victory is mine. And I was using the alliteration on the Vs. Yes. Just to show the boys what alliteration is. It is using letters yes. to mirror a sound. Yes, you yes. Know? Yes, yes. Oh my God. Oh, look, you have you I, I mean I, I can't tell you some more. I I love I love your I love your your um your your stories and expressions. You you also this week you, you and I spoke and you told me that you met some some important people that 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 mean a lot to America. You talked about um Shirley Chisholm, you talked about Martin Luther King. And I don't want to mention the third gentleman who was here with Martin Luther King. So tell us the story about Shirley Chisholm, uh, why she comes to you and where she, you know, what she do. And tell us especially about Martin Luther King and who was with him. Okay. Shirley Chisholm, I had the pleasure. She spent one whole day with me at my school in Green Island before I came to St. Charles. And let me tell you the background to it. Chisholm is her name, right? Yes. Her background was her father came from Guyana, right. migrated to Barbados, and married a Barbados lady from Christchurch in British Town, right. okay, yes. in, 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 in Barbados. But she was born in the United States in New York, but right. a very strong was yes. connection. You know? I remember when I speak, I spoke to her. I said, but I could still I can still hear faint sing a faint accent of Barbados. Yeah, I never lose it. You know, she spoke. Yeah. Anyhow, let me give you the background again. This is how she came to Green, Green Island. A gentleman called Mr. John Chisholm was on the first board of Green Island Secondary School. He was the overseer of the large sugar estate in Green Island called Winchester. Yeah. Named John Chisholm. His wife was Mrs. Chisholm, who was the principal of the Green Island Primary School. And some of you are listening there. She probably was your <laughs> principal. <laughs> Mrs. Chisholm is the Chisholm sister-in-law. Oh, <laughs> so after, after Mrs. Chisholm, she was the first person to dare to run for president of the United States. And a black woman. Yes. Way back when it was... I think 70, it was 1972, I can't 71, 72, 72, yes, yes. Yeah. After the election, you know, she lost it, of course. She decided to come to Jamaica to spend about a week with her relatives in Green Island to, rec to <laughs> recover it, okay? And decided that she had heard about the school and thought she would spend a day at the school because she was very interested in education. And so I get to know her and to meet her. Oh. Uh, that is one, that's Shirley Chisholm. As a, as a fiery woman, you know, a fiery, fiery woman. She was, oh man, she's well respected in the in the ranks of the, the political rank, ranks in America. When she, spoke to, when she spoke to the staff and students, you could drop a pin at the back. Oh. She was so, her enthusiasm was captivating. Okay, Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he came to Jamaica to speak at the graduation of UWI. Okay. What year was it again? I get my years mixed up with the 1968. 1963. I can't remember. Oh, so it's before. Okay. I, I, I can't remember. Yeah. But anyhow, he came. And I always followed him because remember my Marcus Garvey background yes. and my Black is Beautiful background and what he was standing up for. And before my father had passed, my father was a great follower of him too, you know. Right. So it, I was a young teacher at Cornwall College then. And I, seem, I, I heard it was on the radio and, and in the press 
that he was leaving Jamaica, but prior to that, he was coming to, Mon to Montego Bay for, for a little repast before leaving. Right. But he would depart Jamaica from Montego Bay. And I was always very forward. And I said, but if he's leaving from Montego Bay, he'll leave Montego Bay, if I can just meet him to shake his hand. <laughs> so I went to my master, Mr. Barrett, I said, look, I hear that Martin Luther King is passing through. And I have a free period after the break, but I don't know, but I would like to go to the sanctuary airport just to meet him to shake his hand to come out. He said, go ahead, man. And if, if there's any delay, it's all right. I'll cover for you. Can you imagine? <laughs> you can bring your camera back online. Yes. Bring, you are bringing your camera back? No, no, you're not on. You're not. You're not you got to bring your, your, your dog is on. Your dog's picture is here. We need to bring your camera back online. So what do I do now? Uh, there is uh, a button that says those little three buttons. It should say start video. It says Social Network Club wants to send you notifications. So I no. hit allow that. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't bring any notification. Just there, there's three dots. Click on the three dots. No, it's not that. Come on. Wait a second. Not saying it. Okay, there you are. There you are. Yeah, you are back. Okay. <laughs> Don't ask me what I did. <laughs> I just touched a few things. Don't even go back there. I'm far from the screen. <laughs> okay, there you are. Anyhow, okay, great. I left, I left. And it was a break, so I didn't leave a class and rushed out to the Sanctuary Airport. And in those days, the VIP room was just the second floor. That's very simple. And I went out, of course, there was security and policemen and, and usually in their brown uniform, you know, the, the brass was there. And I learned something the other day. I went up and how am I going to get in? Yes. <laughs> so I just went, gentlemen, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. And people just gave me. <laughs> I don't know where I went, but I know what this man looked like. <laughs> and I went right up to Martin Luther, introduced myself, and told him how I grew up in the Garvey movement in Panama, and so on and so forth. And we spoke for about half an hour. Oh my gosh! But I didn't want to, and I didn't want to, over, and I backed away. I never forget that. And how very calm he was, how pleasant, how accommodating. Yes. That was the first and the last time I've ever had contact with him. Oh, my okay. God. That's important. I followed. So when he was unfortunately assassinated, it did hurt us a lot because we felt here was somebody that we met and we knew, even though for a short while. My God. So you asked me for another person, uh, Cong the late Congressman John Lewis. Yes. As you know, the great associate of Martin Luther King. Yes. I not only met John Lewis and became great friends, <laughs> but he stayed one whole evening in my house here in Montego Bay, the same place where I am. <laughs> All that happened was this. In those days, I don't know if they still have it, the Jamaica Tourist Board had a program called Meet the People. Terrific mm -hmm. program. And what they did was that groups of people who came who were interested were invited to spend a short time one evening in a house, a Jamaican they, they house. Call it fam, they call it fam trips now, um, the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Wonderful, because I met an, a guy from me and his wife who was a cousin of mine, came from California, whom I didn't know, but his wife ran all the food at the Olympics. And when she came, his name was Clark. And when the people <laughs> called and said, this guy resembles you, you know. Yeah. And when he came, not my husband. his father came from the same place that my father came from in Trelaw. Oh, okay. <laughs> but to get back to this now, got this call from the tourist board, the Montego Bay chapter. Can we host the Black Caucus of the United States Congress? I mean, I can't say no to that, am I? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Many of the people I used to just see in the Ebony magazine, I said, sure. <laughs> and they said, okay, we'll, they will come around 
for cocktails, just as cocktail are, and they leave you just about um, half a seven quarter to eight to come back to the hotel for dinner. Where they stay in Half Moon or the Holiday Inn, I can't even remember. Right. This beautiful coat turned up on time, and this large group of people descended on my house. And by that time, I think, I, I hope Mrs. Mighty is listening and other members of the staff at Conwell because at, at Tam Shop, because I always invite them all yes. to meet anybody like this. They were there. I remember Reverend Sam Reed was there, and several others came to meet these people. And in the group, in that group, we had John Lewis. But that night, we had to play some Jamaican music. <laughs> <clears throat> so I was introduced to Paul Herlock. This one-man band is the first time I'm hearing this one-man band. Didn't know what he would do. And I asked him if he could come to provide some, I thought it was just good, some background music. And when he came and, and this keyboard became a full orchestra of Jamaican music, these people who came just for some cocktails and some orders started up dancing. <laughs> and Paul would not stop playing and they would not stop dancing. I remember at one stage as a young man came to me, his shirt dripping wet. It was John Lewis. And I had offered him one of my shirts, but he didn't take it. <laughs> I have to tell you that around about 8 o'clock, 8.15, nobody was moving. That's I said, well, what was going to happen? Right. And all we had prepared were hors d'oeuvres. Yes. So I saw my wife, we got... I saw all the women in a huddle. I don't know what they were discussing, <laughs> but I just saw them disappear. I don't know where they went to. <laughs> but in 20 minutes, half an hour, I saw each return and by them, I bet it all the neighbors around Unity Hall, you know? <laughs> this one coming with a pot cover, this one with, with a tray, <laughs> this one with some parrots, A parrot's dish. We, <laughs> you got it. Oh, you know. <laughs> there were some students. I can't remember. I had a feeling some students from the college were there, but I cannot remember. And if you were there, let me know, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> we got on the table. What we did, you know, um, I had borrowed some tables from the multipurpose hall, and the tables we put together right. yes. because of this group coming. Uh -huh. And those tables you know, were very versatile. We could put right. them in all kinds of known and Yes, yes. In the shape of an L. And those ladies set up one magnificent Jamaican buffet. And the music is going to dancing and they started to eat. They never left my house until about quarter to 3 a.m. <laughs> the following morning. It was <laughs> one great evening. It's, it's John the first time that they've ever met. John Lewis, who died recently. And, and, and did you ever and keep we kept in touch? Did you keep in touch yes, with John? for a while, but you know how things are? Yes. We kept in touch for a while, but you know how things are? You tend to fade away after time. Yes. But a great human being. Yes. But never forget him. Yeah. Never forget him. <laughs> and so... It's, it's really, great, the really, really great to, to hear um, that John Lewis was with you there. Uh, that, I mean, he's such a... He's such a, um, a, a pinnacle type of, type of a guy in America. Everybody in America knows who John Lewis is. And if you don't know who John Lewis is, something is wrong. He's living here. <laughs> yes. And that night, you know, Mrs. Coretta Scott King should have come. But she developed some illness, something like the flu, and never came to Jamaica with a group at all. Oh. But she was beaten, but, and they said, when I told my friends about who was coming, I just said, Mrs. Martin Luther King oh is coming. So she was the drawing card. Oh, my and God. So I didn't use so much. Black card, black card. Right. She was not the black card, but she was. Yes, um, I, 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 you know, I, you, you've met some really interesting people, but I, I want to turn to Teacher Cook, headmaster ah, yes. of boys' school. <laughs> Tell me about Teacher yeah, yeah, Cook yeah. all the way up until his, uh, his, his death. When I came to Montego Bay to start the YMCA, Teacher Cook was one of the first persons that I met. You remember now that the boys' school was just almost right. down the road from the Y. 
Yes. And he had just left or was about to leave and he was succeeded by Mr. Wesley Hewling, who became later Hewling, on president yes. of the JC. You probably remember because the memory was chairman of the board. I remember he was there. He, he, Mr. Hewling, he, um, he, I, I think he was the one who came to my teaching practice. Um, we, oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he helped us a great deal as a great yeah. teacher. Yeah. Yes. So, um, Teacher Cook, I was then, as you know, a boarding master at Cook House at Cornwall College. Right. His brother, Cook, we used to call him, Howard Cook Jr., was also on the staff. He had an honors degree in history. And we also had a staff football team. Cooksey played a dangerous forward on that team. It's what we entered the we entered the business house competition locally. Yes. The Samsha men's staff team. <laughs> and one one year I think we went all the way to Rossi's and to Mannings. And we dropped foot on them guys down there. <laughs> because we kept it at, at Cornwall, we kept it. Okay. I got to know Mr. Cook very well because I was a member of the, I was secretary of the St. James Council of Voluntary Services, and he was on that. Uh, I also, with Dr. Hastings, started a boys club at Mount Salem, uh, and those lands now occupied by the Cornwall Regional Hospital. Oh, uh, no. yes. And, and Mr. Cook knew all about that was going on there. And uh, I was involved with the Montego Bay Boys Club. I was there every Tuesday evening, just working with the guys, not anything special, helping them in doing stuff. Teacher mm -hmm. Cook was also involved in, with yeah. him and persons like Dr. Herbert Morrison, mm -hmm. Clifford Lisa. Those very busy people yes. had time mm -hmm. to spend with the young men. Yes. They didn't say too busy because we have work to do. Right, right. They found time. And Teacher Cook was one of those. Yes. And on one occasion, when he had entered politics, he was running up and down. And he said, look, my younger son, you know, uh, I've not seen him as frequently as I can. And I said, why not send him to the boarding school? At Colorado, they live just up the road, you know, mm -hmm. Brandon Hill. And uh, he said, well, you know, this is long and the story short, that young cook, Maki, we used to call him, became a boarder at Cook House. <laughs> and he became like my little brother. You know, people, where the parents <laughs> call you to find the whole little brother doing <laughs> So it turned out to be that I got very close to the cook so that every boxing day, I was invited to their house for a Chinese dinner. You know, Mrs. <laughs> 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 Every boxing day, as far as I can recall, I was at the yes. house yes. for that Chinese. They had a Mrs. Cook, I think it was her brother or some relative, a fantastic Chinese cook. And you know what? And we don't want to miss that. So myself and a number of other young members of Stafford Cornwall were always there. Yes. Cut it short, it came to the time now when I was appointed principal of Sam Sharp, no, of Green Island, and had to leave. Right, Cornwall. Tiga Bay. Yes. And had to leave Cornwall. And they decided to put on a little farewell for me in Montego Bay. What is that hotel that is opposite on top of the hill near to Montego Bay High School? Call again now. Um, oh, you know it. It's a I know. beautiful view. Yes, I'm it. yes, and it has a beautiful view looking down. That's I, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, 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 it's a small me. one, yes. So they decided to run that little dinner and give me a little gift. And but there was a problem because that evening there was some big international conference going on in Montego Bay. And almost everybody and his wife were going to that one. And I'm saying, why? My thing sought because nobody's going to come to mind. Anyhow, I turned up as being the guest. My wife, Faye, and kids and all of that, we went. And it so happened, when I got there, who was there? <laughs> Howard Cook. 
<laughs> and he said, I said, but I thought he said, said, yes. He had to make a choice between going to this international conference or coming to my send off. And he thought coming to my send off was where he should be. Never forget that. How could you forget oh, that? Yeah. And so there was this, it was only, uh, it turned out to be a fantastic person. What I liked about those persons too was that it never got to their head. When, he, when I was commodore of the Yacht Club, I had the pleasure, the Jamaica Olympic Association had a meeting in Montego Bay at the Yacht Club. And I took the opportunity of inducting Sir Howard Felix Hanlon Cook, Knight Grand Cross of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, Knight Grand Cross of the Most Victorian Order, Commander of the Order of Distinction, I to induct him as a life member of the Montego Bay. Oh Union. my gosh. And, 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 and he was the first person ever to be. And I had the pleasure because I was commodore of the club at the time to induct him. And that connection continued right until his passing. And I remember attending his funeral both. It was at the North Street Cathedral and walking up to Hero Circle and then greeting Lady Cook sitting in a little chair not too far away from the event at mm. the Hero Circle burial site. And he so was, he was our, our governor general for, for several years. Oh, for several years. Yeah, several yes. years. Yes. And Michael has turned out a number of governors general. And, oh. and a number of them have been teachers. Like the first one was Sir Clifford Campbell. Right. From Westmoreland. Yes. C.C. Campbell from, as a Michael man. Uh, Sir Florizel Glasspool was not a Michael man. He went to Wilmers, but taught for a while. He became an accountant. Um, and then afterwards, we had Sir Howard Felix Cook. Yes. And, and several others. Of course, um, uh, we had Professor Hall, yes. who was uh, uh, still is a very ardent past student of Rossi's came to the university, did extraordinarily well, and came back and became the principal of the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies. Wow. Um, he was the one who invited me to King's House to be a uh, senior advisor to the governor general. Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, years there at King's House, yeah. You know, you know, um, you know I'm still in insurance, in the insurance business. Um, and I remember the day when I stepped inside the mutual life building in that elevator and he was there and he said yes. he says he said to me what what a fine young man you, you're tall you're looking good i want you to be a life insurance salesman and he, he says come over to my That's office awesome. <laughs> you know i went over to his office over um he was at uh, across the street from life of jamaica across the street from yes. uh, bam, banana lot ba banana lounge or something like that and he sent me you know at his expense to kingston he sent me to do a class a couple of days and i took the exam and passed it but he want i was supposed to go and work with him but by the time i got back to montego bay he was leaving that insurance company so i went to the life of jamaica <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, okay. When he was terrific, as a matter of fact, as you know, I served on the board of Mutual Life Insurance Company for over 25 years. Yes, yes, yes. And um, he was one of those who rooted for me, actually. Oh, boy. And the last three years of Mutual Life, which was the largest insurance company of the Caribbean. Caribbean. And the first fully owned Jamaican company in that sort of financial business. Yeah. I was the last chairman of the last three years of mutual. You were? Okay, okay, okay. Last three years. Oh my gosh. Chairman of mutual. And Guardian Life is a child of mutual. You must remember that. Mutual right. Life yes. started Guardian Life. Guardian Life. Trinidad. Yes. 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 And wow. um, the only reason why it was registered as a Trinidad entity at that time was that there was a law in Trinidad called the Alien Land Holding Ordinance, 
which no foreign company could have majority shares in any company in Trinidad. Oh. And so we owned 49% and Trinidad was 51. Oh. But that law has now been abolished and therefore companies can come in and own whatever they want. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, so Guardian Life is the child of Mutual and Guardian is still continuing. I am looking, I am looking at, at something here um, that says um, computer science lab, first lab, first computer science lab in Jamaica, uh, in school in Jamaica. Uh, is, yeah. that, is that true? Uh, I mean, that that's lab, not, that, that professor, huh? That lab, which was set up in the room that you knew as room seven, Room seven. <laughs> Number room seven. Is it was just the first of its kind? Is that right? That is why every summer we had teachers from all over Jamaica came who came to some shop, resided there to learn this strange thing called computer science. <laughs> and don't tell them that. We were also the first in the Caribbean. And that was why students from all over the Caribbean, Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, <laughs> yes. came up with up to did computer science in room seven. In room seven. <laughs> and it was done in this. I always had interests in computers, even though I was never really a computer person like my son, Andre. And when we were at Green Island, we put together a computer kit and entered in the science exhibition. That was the year when we had won, I think the All Island Prize, I'm not sure. And so I linked up with Central Connecticut State University from way back when. And how I linked up with Central Connecticut, there was an education officer in charge of mathematics, uh, Mrs. Mavis Cargill, her Christian name was Mavis Samuels great soloist, beautiful soprano, member of the choir of the Jonestown Baptist Church. She came down to Sam shop on one occasion and said, look, we had some years ago with Dr. Phyllis McPherson Russell, who was then education minister, started a program in Kingston, preparing students, teachers for maths degrees of Central Connecticut University. It worked well for a couple of years and then died. Mm. Would you like to start it up? I said, yes, naturally, I don't back out on things. So this long and start of this is what they, I got in contact with Central Connecticut State in, in no time, they were in Montego Bay. People like George Miller, Mr. Spooner and several others came down and we arranged to go to Washington. <laughs> yes. Organized headquarters of the OAS, the Organization of American State, where I was able to put my project to them of starting mathematics and computer science for teachers at Sam Sharp. I have the picture up right now, and I see oh, Professor George Miller. George Miller. George this is Miller. the George Miller right there, yes. And then some Sam Sharp students. Yeah, and several, and he was one of the great motivators behind this program. Yes, yes. He died, unfortunately, years ago. I think Mrs. Walden went to his funeral representing all of us, you know? Yes. I, and so the OAS decided not only were they going to fund the first couple of years, but that they would supply us with the first 10 computers and printers. The Organization of American States um, I, I remember I remember him very clearly. He invited me as one of the first set of students to come to Central Connecticut State. I left the island to go to Central Connecticut, Central Connecticut State University, went on the campus. New yes, because I had started the math course on Sam Sharp camp. I still have several units. The, um, of of uh, calculus and other other math programs that I did there on Sam Sharp, okay. so I I was supposed to get con continue with my education at Central Connecticut State. Went on campus, went through the summer, and was to start, but um, financial aid kick, 
kick my butt and I couldn't, uh, <laughs> I couldn't go. Yes. But that is how we established this program. And then it was very interesting to note that we moved from maths and computer science. We went into areas like guidance and counseling, yes. uh, into educational management. Yes. And we went on master's program. Master's, yes. And several yes. of our graduates did their PhDs or their and their masters, yes. Education right there. That's how it started. Yes, yes. Going to Washington, and I should tell you something. Why is it very good for a country to have its own airline, even though you may not see it coming in in dollars in terms of it comes in other ways? When I went to Air Jamaica to ask them how much it will cost to bring those computers down, they look at me and say zero. I said, what do you mean zero? <laughs> what you are doing, we want to support it. So it will cost you nothing. The second time they did that is when I bought a whole lot of instruments in second hand and brand new in Miami to start the Granville Band. The band. Remembering that I needed money to pay for the transportation. Mm -hmm. The guy at Cargo at Air Jamaica, Miami said, no problem. Send it freight forward, and you can pay at that end. That time, they don't know I don't have any money left <sighs> in Montreal Bay. <laughs> so when I came down to Jamaica now, I called a guy who was then, I think, manager of Air Jamaica Cargo, Mike Lazarus. Calabar, old boy. Yes. And I said, look, we're bringing in some instruments for the youngsters who used to give us trouble in Granville. And we can't pay for it now, but we need to know what you can arrange. By the following day, he called me to say, Air Jamaica will charge you nothing. We want to be associated with this program. You see this picture that has shown up there? Yes. This is the first rehearsal that we had on campus <laughs> with the students, girls and boys from Granville. You see that guy, Marshall, standing to the right-hand side of Mr. Lowe? Yes. I don't even remember him. Of course, we don't remember. <laughs> Listen, but Marshall left and went to Botswana in Africa. Oh. And was a teacher in Africa and unfortunately died there. And, but the memorial service was held at the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Granville. And I attended, Mrs. Walden attended, and several others. Do you see that guy to the right of Marshall? Urban? Who is that? Urban. Uh, he was our physical education man that oh, came to the okay. college. Okay, okay. I, I, in Toronto. I, yes, I don't remember him. In Toronto. So okay. this band, by the way, is no longer a marching band only. It's a band of nearly 80. Yes. Run by... Mr. Horton. Up Sam Sharp up to this day. Mr. Horton. Now, they now have a concert band section of about 80 players. Oh. And they're well known today as one of Jamaica's best musical groups of its kind. Yes, I, I went to... These were poor youngsters who gave us trouble. We couldn't use the playing field, do you remember? Yes, they I do. I yes. People were saying, call the police. <laughs> saying, I can't do that. And there was a term soft. You know, I'm soft. I went to the police, might as well be shut down this institution for training youngsters and go back to a normal business because <laughs> <laughs> I went to I, I went to a conference one year. Uh it may have been three years ago or the one yes, it's the three years of 2017. And while, while, while I was eating, then this, this, this band was playing. And, and, and you know, it was really good um, listening to them while I ate. As I went over to congratulate this young gentleman who was leading the band and found out that it was the Sam Sharp, a part of the Sam Sharp marching band playing. And it was really good. It was really, really good. He specialized in music. He came after your time to Sam Sharp. But he's now there, the tutor, still there. Right. Horton. Is that his name, Horton? Horton, yes. Mr. Yes, Horton. Horton. Yeah, we talked. Yes. 
he has a twin brother who works in immigration at the airport and I mix them up all the time. <laughs> Vincent Houghton, a great teacher of music. He went abroad and got his degrees. Yes. Graduate of Sam Shop is still continuing the tradition that you guys started. You didn't you didn't talk about Billy Cook who was in the picture and um and and uh, Mr. Lowe. <laughs> Billy Cook, the great musician. You see that piano that Billy Cook is playing? I think there's a picture there of him. Yes. Would you realize that one of the persons that we met at Sam Sharp was the great Bernstein, the great conductor of the New York Philharmonic oh. Orchestra? Wow. Let me tell you the, the Sam Sharp Bernstein connection. He came to Montego Bay. He stayed at the Round Hill, naturally. He came to not so much for holiday, but to compose music. But he didn't have a reliable instrument. I don't know who told the manager of, of Half Moon that check with me at Sam Sharp College. We have a brand new yeah. Yamaha piano, which we are hardly using. <laughs> check on him, and I think he will make it available. <laughs> Long story, something gone wrong again. Oh, yes. Uh, why are you going to have to? Play, play with that thing again. Because uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm seeing your pop. Um, You're still seeing me? Yeah, I can see you. Okay, there you are. There you are. <laughs> I did that. I wish I could know what I did. <laughs> so what I'm talking about now, I'm talking about... Uh, You're talking about Ber Ber Bernstein. Bernstein. And Bernstein. His, in, yes. In not so long ago, I got talking to the manager. I got talking to Bernstein. I've never met him. You know, we only spoke on the phone to this day. And I would have been greatly, you know, thrilled that I, because, you know, I love, my, I love my classical music, as you know. And so the long start of it, we loaned them the Yamaha piano that was in the multipurpose hall. Oh, my gosh. What he did, he tuned it when it arrived. Yeah. And when he came back, just about two weeks afterwards, he had it tuned again. <laughs> that is why I used to tell you students, treat this piano with care. <laughs> the great Bernstein of New York. <laughs> Play it on it. Touched it. And if you touch it, you remember I used to tell you that, be careful. He That's touched right. it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a picture of here which you will probably send to you said to your colleagues, there's a story behind almost every picture that you've got. Yes. Yeah, Bernstein. That's really and, nice. Um, yeah, I, music and me, well, my father and yeah. my mother introduced me to that, as I told you last week about learning the Dodi Revi Mi Fa Fil Sol. Yes. But when I had been learning trade to repair radios in Cologne and Panama as a little boy, they only had one record <laughs> One of my jobs was to check the record players to make sure they were cheating <laughs> right. One record, and that record was, and you had to change the needle, you know what I mean, with that name. When I came to Jamaica and was a young teacher at Calabar at the time, I had not come down to Montego Bay yet. One Sunday evening, RJR was, they used to have a beautiful classical program. Yes. Which was a nine to ten, the last hour of transmission. And start, with, start with Elizabeth Serenade. <laughs> I used to tune into that. A lot of people, you know, and so why they cut this out? But every now and again, I noticed they do it on a Sunday evening when my friend who does the can't, where we find people program, what is his name now? He will play a program. But anyhow, I heard this bit of music coming over RJR. But I couldn't tell you what it was. I wasn't interested in what it was. Well, as a little boy in Panama, because I could, I could hear it. So I called Arja the next day to find out. So they told me it was Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor oh. that they played that Sunday evening. Okay. And I asked them, where could I get a copy? They told me if I go down to Stanley Motor on Harbor Street, Stanley Motor. <laughs> so I went to Stanley Motor to buy a 33 and a third. 
<laughs> Thai concerto. On the other side was a concerto by Max Brook. Yeah. And this was my first classical record in my collection that I bought. <laughs> and, then, and guess what? A few weeks ago, I'm, I'm going through what you call it, YouTube, and came upon the thing again. Oh. And guess, it was not a video. Guess who was playing it? None other than um, Farah Khan. Oh. Farah Khan, okay. He's, he's Jamaican too, you know. Yes. I didn't realize he was a classical musician. Uh -huh. You can go oh. in it afterwards and check. And those are people yeah, I'll check that out. I'll definitely check that out. Definitely. And me, the violin, and guess what? The audience gave him a standing ovation. I did not even know he could pluck one string on a violin. Oh, my gosh. Oh, okay. With that virtuosity yes. that you get from a classical violinist, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Now, uh, so... That's that. I mean, I, I, I sit here all day long. I tell you, so, but I want to ask you about Jamal. Jamal, you have to remind us what Jamal means and what was your part that you played in Jamal. As I thought Jamal class, you introduced it also on campus while we were there. But I think we need to understand what is Jamal, why did it come about, and your part to play in Jamal. When I went to Green Island in 1969, there were quite a number of teenagers who were now 15 and beyond out of school, but right. many of them had a challenge with reading. Right. And so I had a wonderful staff and anything you ask them to do, they're ready. <laughs> we said, look, can we not have something in the evenings? We'll call it opportunity. Oh, don't call it an illiteracy because you know, literacy right. means ignorance. <laughs> I'm not gonna go. So opportunity hour. And this place, one classroom full, another classroom full. Because another thing that I did, while presenting the basics in reading and writing to them, we also had some technical things. They, some of them, men who were carpenters, were going down and seeing a wood machine for the first time. Oh, we had a workshop fully equipped. So there was a session when they could go down with people like, uh, Mr. Gay we had, who was a woodwork teacher, a young guy from England, did a magnificent, okay. When I can never forget Michael Manley visiting Green Island and, spent in, and spending a part of the day there. And when I told him this and I was telling him, we don't call it a literacy class, we call it opportunity hour. And he said, no. I disagree with you that if a man can't read, man, tell him he can't read. You know, he had a way of speaking, and I didn't believe that. Call it literacy for what it's worth. And believe you me, shortly after that, when we started to call it literacy, the class started to do it. Oh, my gosh. Because you knew the Jamaican psyche. Yes, yes. It didn't mean, it didn't mean that you can't read and write. It means that you were stupid. Proud, and, yes. And yes. literally ignorant, you know, so we didn't want, anyhow, not long after that, the Jamaican movement for the advancement, no, the Jamaican literacy program, it was not yet Jama, Jamaican right. literacy program through the Social Development Commission was started. Oh. And I was invited to join the board from way back then when I was at Green Island. Oh. When I was there, it was changed to Jamal, which is a Jamaican movement for the advancement of literacy okay it was a tremendous thing and then it became a thing now and we had people like joyce robinson who was a former director of the jamaica library service who left that and came over to push jamal and she had people on television who had learned to read it became a thing now. not i'm hiding that image, but it was a thing a graduate who had started being illiterate was now elected to the board. I'll never forget that day. And so Jamal was introducing. So why I introduced it to Tamda was that I was coming from a background of literacy from Green Island days. Okay. And um, during my time, it changed, it changed to the Jamaican Foundation for lifelong learning, which is now J-F-L-L. Right. right. And so I had 
another 25, 26 years associated with them. Oh, uh, so, so um, Dr. Dr. Clark, <clears throat> um, many people have heard says Jamal is a failure, Jamal, Jamal is a failure. What, what, what do they mean? And Absolutely. what is your ex tell, tell us, tell us. Understand. Yeah. Many businesses started, a lot of businesses started having Jamal classes at their workplaces. Right. It was absolutely not a failure. And when okay. you look at literacy, I can't remember the statistics now, but Jamaican illiteracy was way, way high. Right. After a number of years of the literacy program, Jamal, it came all the way down. Oh, so that is a way to check it. Check your statistics. I don't have the things in front of me now. Right, 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 right. So it was not a failure. I can tell you. If it were, I would have told you. Yes, and I know. I, I you know, how people talk, uh, and it's you, know, you, know, you hear you have you, a way of throwing water, cold water, and yes. stuff. But it was get out there and stop talking and do it and start doing. It. <laughs> you see me in a photograph. I don't know if you were in the group. Picking up stones and planting grass. Yes, I, I, I was going to show you. <laughs> well, that, my philosophy is you are not too big to do that with your students because right. when they leave, they go away and do the same thing with their own. Yes. And yes. There is dignity in work. In work. Well, I, 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 I do know on, once upon a time, um, you, talk, you said something to me. Because I was walking with my, you know, country boy, I was walking with my head down all the time because I'm tall, you know? Yeah. And I remember you stopped me on campus one day and say, um, Mr. Gilling, um, you taught me how to walk fast because it means something. Walk me out, taught me how to look straight ahead because it meant something. And just that alone, help to build something different because yeah. now I am looking forward right? I'm not looking down because when I'm looking down I'm not seeing anything that's going on around me I'm looking forward and seeing everything that's going on and I'm walking fast because I have something else that I can do absolutely no it's not only you alone several <laughs> and when you begin to look down like that is it because you have a negative concept of self Yes. There's nothing wrong with you. I used to tell people, if God made you, and God is a know-all and all knowledge, you're not an idiot. You can't, how can you be an idiot? You're something that was there for walk tall. You have dignity inside of you. Try your best to find what that talent is and develop it. And the thing I always said, and I remember Mr. Um, Stewart used to repeat it whenever I said it to Every human being is born with an inalienable capacity for excellence in at least one thing. Yeah. What the teacher and the parent needs to do is to find out what that thing is. Uh -huh. Student, the teacher, the child to develop it. I used to find once you help them to develop it, you cut them loose, lock of mercy, they're gone. Because that was my green Alex experience. When they tell me everybody fail, fail what? Yes. One of those who came to Green Island became professor of foreign languages at UWI Mona. And so here goes, here goes. Don Hall, I don't know if you, if you remember him, Don Hall, he says, esteemed, great, and uh, venerable Dr. Simon Clark, thank you for introducing me to Latin in Form 1C at Cornwall College. Yeah, that forget him. That, that experience has served me well in life. Those classes gave me a great foundation to deal with the English language and even served me when I went to, to further studies, including three years of Greek. I still remember you saying, boy, what do you mean you can't? You have men making transmitters and receivers the size of a pinhead. And you are telling me that you can't translate a simple Latin sentence. Now, what is the verb? Is that what the verb is? <laughs> so second and third person. And, uh, um, thank you, Don. I for remember that. him very well. Give him my special regards. And my friend, it's been a long time, but those were great days. 
It's nice. That's a very nice compliment, uh, you know, but it's coming in, but I can't catch everybody's because I'm listening to you so much. But yeah. he's, he's came in real nicely. Thank you so much, Don, for that. Uh, so J- Jamal is a success. And Jamal taught a lot of people uh, uh, give them confidence, give them confidence that they, they okay. know. I remember my father died, right? Um, and my mom said, my father was could not read, right? And And so when he left and came to America, one of the issues that he had was taking the bus to work because he can't find his way. And, um, and so he gets lost all the time because he can't read what's on the, on the signs and the posts. And even inside the bus, he doesn't know when he gets to his, his, his stops and so forth. Yeah. And so that is, is something that, that is, uh, you know, e- even if you just learn to read basic reading, it can help you in life. It gives you a different level of confidence so that you become a part of and can, and can operate. It is very liberating, absolutely. It's like being caught in a subway station at in Tokyo. Yes. Don't know. And where. I say, oh, no, people feel because when I look up, <laughs> I couldn't tell you where that way was that way. <laughs> but I gather what they've done now. There's some sub things in English. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I, I said it was a good experience for me because then I understood how people who had this problem felt when they were in this environment with words that they could not understand. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh my God. So, um, you know, I remember, I remember back in 1979 when, 79, when polio broke out in Montego Bay. I remember that. I remember just after that, they, they had herpes break out across the world, pretty much mostly in America. But then in, in, uh, in the middle of 1984, 85, there was a breakout of HIV AIDS. And you have served on a board. I want to know about your experience. What is it? Why did you become, why, why did you join that? And, and what, what's your experience in, in, with the HIV AIDS? Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, I was at UNESCO at the time. I didn't know anything about any of the technical things about AIDS, but I know it was a serious pandemic, which we had to do something. So while attending seminars in Paris, I always went to the AIDS, HIV ones, because I wanted to learn more about it. Lo and behold, UNESCO appointed me as a a member of their delegation to join the World Health Organization on a committee to look into AIDS and to see to what extent both the World Health Organization, the Pan American Health Organization, and UNESCO could come up with some some solution, okay? So I went to meetings at Geneva in the World Health Organization headquarters. Not an expert on AIDS, but I used to talk a lot at what I learned, okay? So I found myself going to a lot of AIDS meetings in Africa, in Europe, and in Asia, merely to share some of the experiences. And what they wanted to have done, they said, you guys are educators. What we need to do is to introduce a program in education across the world that can be preventive of persons coming in contact with the virus itself. And so I became part of that group. And that was why Jamaica was selected as the first country in the world to set up an AIDS education program, AIDS education prevention program, because I was on the international committee. Oh. The, second program was, the second program was set up in the Philippines, and my very good friend and colleague, Alan Condor in the Philippines, set up the second one in the world in the Philippines because he represented the Philippines on that same committee, and therefore we knew. And therefore, when I came to Jamaica, a group was instrumental as UNESCO in stimulating the startup of the AIDS committee, National AIDS Committee. So I was on that preliminary one, and we did a lot of the preliminary work. Way back then, but I must tell people I'm no expert in it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
of the thing and helping to get things done and making a connection with people. Well, yes, I, I went to many meetings and I had to be telling people, I remember going to the Cameroons in West Africa. I just, I'm not an expert. But this is what I have experienced going here. And there. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So you earlier mentioned that um, you had Michael Manley at your school. Um, what's your experience with Michael Manley, uh, um, one of our great leaders uh, in, in Jamaica? Um, have you had any other experience with him and, and, and what are they? Yes, okay. I used to hear a lot about him. Matthew, I had met his father mm -hmm. in Kingston right. because I was very interested in cars. His father drove a black Jaguar. <laughs> black Jaguar was always in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> a number of our boys, he had come into Jonestown. We were around about the Baptist church and we gathered around this, looking at the car. This great bad black jagger with its, some very imposing uh, fenders and grills at the front. And while we were in, he came and talked to us, you know, young men and so on. And we were very impressed with this great man that we used to hear about, this great lawyer talking to us like that. That, that was my encounter. But anyhow, his son. Mm -hmm. It was during the heat of the politics. And he had come down to Western Jamaica to some political meeting, I don't know what it was, but was invited by, I don't know whether it was a John Chisholm, a member of the board, or Arthur Wint probably, because he and Arthur Wint were very close friends. Yeah. Because they were students in London. Yes. Uh, after the World War. Well, yes, 47. But... School of Economics, Michael was there, and uh, Arthur Wint was in the medical school. So you want to change that again because you're you're back to the puppy again. Oh, there you are. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read why it happened, but don't don't tell me now, okay? Okay. And so, Michael, it might have been Michael who told him to drop by the school now. I'm chairman. I'm the first chairman, and he was a close friend of Arthur, and was a great fan of Arthur because he was personally at the 1948 Olympics when Arthur won the first gold medal for Jamaica, but of course, they didn't play the Jamaica national anthem. They played God Save. <laughs> it was God Save the King at the time. That's right. <laughs> and Arthur has always told me that when his first daughter was born and he needed a godfather, Michael asked Arthur to be the girl's godfather. <laughs> <laughs> It might have been him. I'm not sure. Arthur was chairman, first chairman of the Green Island Board, and I was the first principal. So we were told that Michael Manley is making, making, making a brief stop. He was then prime minister doing all kind of things, you know, mm. of Jamaica. And I said, why? And it was a brief stop. We can do a quick program. And... Uh, so what I did, I put a quick program together, music I gathered, it was very keen on classical music. And we had a, a music group, woodwinds and brass and so on. I said, we'll play a little thing for him. We had a teacher from Toronto, um, Mr. Cairns and his wife, who straight out of university medical music school, came down to Green Island to teach. So I took him from point to point. The students had built a pavilion bio playing field mm -hmm. and wired it as part of their hands-on grade 10, 11 program. And Michael was to officially flip the switch to turn it on. And when they, he went to that, he just was just blown away. He went up to the farm now, the thing that really knocked him away and saw 1000 birds that were being reared by students with, with a couple of teachers. And when he learned that we were the largest producers of eggs for the hotels in the grill, <laughs> he didn't understand it. <laughs> all over the place. And I got into trouble with the people in Green Island because he came down for a political meeting. And Michael would not leave. He, oh. went, so he went through every department. And he did something. 
And I don't know if you Green Island students will remember, when he came into the multipurpose hall and sat down with a group of you all at lunchtime mm. and had a, some of a hot lunch with you. You'll yeah. never forget, I will never forget it either. I was blown away. Yeah. But when he was leaving now, the music group had a little thing, a little music thing. I can't remember it was, it was a piece by Mozart, a sonata by Mozart. And here was a little country boy, I can't remember his name, who came from Kendall, you guys who came from Kendall will remember it. <laughs> and he was playing a difficult woodwind instrument called an oboe. And when he played it with all the little nuances of interpretation, I saw Michael with his mouth open. <laughs> this was one of the boys who came there with difficulty reading. Oh. But he became an outstanding musician, played, and by that time, we had an ex Jamaica military band teacher now, musical instrument, Mr. Hawthorne, someone you will remember him, mm. who was a great oboist and taught this youngster to play the oboe. And oh. Michael was there. So no, I got in trouble because I'm not a political person. I, right. I was so politically naive. Yes. One day, a lot of the business people were asking, what is democratic socialism? At a special meeting that Michael was having around the island, and this one was for Western Jamaica, it was held at, is it Holiday Inn? I can't remember. But I got this invitation to come. <laughs> I can't understand anyhow I went. And a number of people asked, could you explain first, Mr. Prime Minister, what is this thing called democratic society? And he pointed down at me, see that man sitting down here named Simon Clark. <laughs> go down to him school in Negril, in Green Island. Go down. <laughs> See what he's doing. And that is democratic. I was so embarrassed and bad because <laughs> I, don't, I was not doing anything. I was just trying to fulfill the needs of people. Embarrassed. I know there are some people I could convince I had no political culture. They don't know how politically naive I was. I had no time for that. And I must say, during my time, I had direct and less direct invitations from both political parties <laughs> but I would I was never interested. I figured I didn't have the time. Because, you know when you know something is not your thing? People must realize it's not your thing. Stay away from it. Stay with your thing and do that well. <laughs> no, so democratic socialism is down at Green Island uh, secondary school. <laughs> you know it's switched to Jamaican dialect, you know. <laughs> if it is possible for you to open and take me in, do it. I don't know, I got on well with nearly all the prime ministers. Edward Siaga, yes. a lot of people didn't realize that myself and Ronnie Twitch used to alternate one month me, one month Ronnie, doing a live call-in talk show program with the Prime Minister from Jamaica House with Edward Siaga. Oh. And it was then I, remember, I, re, I got to know a funny side of him, that this guy could make you because he had this very austere look, in between when advertisements were on and we were waiting to come back on air. I mean, he <laughs> used to keep me ripping up with laughter. And so I got to know very well. Mavis Gilmore, I got to know very well. She was the one who invited me to start the CPTC, the Creative Production and Training Center, which now has the um, channel CPTV. I started that yeah. in 1986, April. Oh. I just shop, not officially yet, for leave. And I told her, well, I can only do this because I'm on leave now. And then by the same time, Air Jamaica now asked me, could I not come during this time to help <laughs> put in place the management development? So I went there too, because never lose the opportunity to learn. And I learned so much. Yes. Yeah, my teacher got management development, but they used to fly me all over the place from stations <laughs> to California, where you used to live. Yes, I, did. Um, I saw you there a couple of times. Yes, yes, you got what you think <laughs> Senior director of management development, and all of this experience I funnel yes. into the development development of people in education because mm -hmm. education is universal. What is happening in the United States right now is a crisis in education, you know. Yes. You start transforming those young people now and the foolishness stop. Yes. 
yeah. there is no culture now for them to take as a, as a relay. Right, right. And to right. Me, they should never go down that route. And it's such a great country, and it still is. Yes. But there's yeah. a way to fix it. Yeah, there's man. A, there's a way to fix it, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, and so... I um, I, I saw one picture went up just now, and um, and yeah, you and I had a little conversation that you met, um, the great um, uh, pr president of Cuba, yeah, Fidel Castro. I would like I'd like to hear about Fidel Castro. Okay, this was again my UNESCO days. Yes. I met him twice on two different occasions. Ah. On this occasion where you see the picture there now. Yes. I um, I was leading in an international conference on education in Havana. Because remember now, I was director for UNESCO for this part of the world, okay? Right. So any kind of UNESCO was my responsibility. Right. So I was organizing. And usually when you're having a program like this, um, the first evening is a reception. They still have it. And what we usually did would be invite the head of state. But the head of state normally doesn't come. He would send his foreign minister or something. <laughs> yeah, they said hotel. And relax. When we look, we saw outriders and so on. And look, came Fidel not turn up. Uh -huh. Fidel came. Uh, you know, we didn't expect, we were expecting the foreign minister. I can't remember who was foreign minister at the time. Yeah. I went out to greet him. And he greeted me and I was talking with him for a while. And then he asked me, the conversation was in Spanish. Yeah. He looked and said, but compañero, tú no tomas nada. You're not drinking anything. <laughs> everybody had a glass or something. <laughs> and in that, he called one of the waiters and said, Bring him a, a mojito. I, a mojito is the Cuban national drink. Right. Fidel Castro gave me the recipe of the Cuban mojito himself personally. Oh! I said, "Is this true? Is this happening?" So, do you make and, it? Do you make it sometimes? What? Do you make the mojito sometimes for yourself? I have not done it for many years, but I mean, I became an expert way back then. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> Una porción de hierba buena, a little portion of mint. Hierba buena is mint that your grandma used to grow. You know? yeah. Una porción de ron, a little, a little bit, a drop of rum. Yeah. Porción de jugo de limón, <laughs> a little portion of yeah. lemon juice. Yeah. Y voila! <laughs> 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 and so I got it, I got it, and I tell them guys, I used to say, if it don't taste good, don't blame me, blame Fidel. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I admired about him? Yes. His humility. Humility. I will never forget when the meeting started, he came to the meeting and sat in the place where the Cuban delegate would normally sit. Is a Cuban one of them? As just an ordinary person, one of them. yeah, yeah. And he would pedir permission para hablar. He would ask permission to speak. Wow. I when I said the second time I met him, I, we didn't have that long, such a long interaction as the first time with the mojito. He was to arrive at five o'clock at the closing function of that meeting. Okay, and Cuba way back then had a poor reputation of being unpunctual. And we touch each other. <laughs> We're going to say, no, five to five, no Fidel. Three to five, no Fidel. On five at five o'clock, I did that. You see, people got up. Fidel arrived. Oh, my God. That was so impressive. You would never forget. I would never forget that. And, uh, and people cheered, not only for his arrival, but for the significance yes. of paying attention to the time. Yes. I never forget. Then I, yes, I did greet him on that occasion, but you know, I didn't have the kind of personal interaction right. that I had. Right. Another thing that I discovered again, my good friend and former pastor, Reverend Sam Reed. Sam Reed. Said, memory. Sam, remember he taught us all. Yeah, Sam man. Yeah, man. I, I remember Sam. We knew each other from Calabar days. We knew very well. He also came from Bunker Hill, by the way, in Jelani, where my father came from. <laughs> 
And by the way, um, Sam went with a group of Jamaican clergymen, I believe, to Havana. And they met Fidel. And Sam came back with a story to say they had some Gideon Bibles. Now, Gideon is a society that distributes Bibles for free. But they didn't want to do anything that would upset any of the Cuban tradition. And so ask for them whether it would be okay for them to distribute any of these Bibles. Just sure, by all means. <laughs> Everybody should read the Bible. It's a great book of culture. He didn't talk about religion. Religion's culture. <laughs> I read it. I read the Bible. He says one of the greatest things in print. And if you can do that to help, fine. And so they were able to, I would never, I, he didn't tell me that. He told the group of Jamaican clergymen. I don't know if any of you clergymen listening were there and remember that, but Sam Reed came back. But I think they were even able to send more because what they had, they, they were a little doubtful as to whether they would be received. Yes. No problem. You can read it. <laughs> it, it, was, here's, it was great. Here's, here's a comment from Lyndon Richards. He says, Dr. Clark, Allow me to say that you have the knack for transmitting value to others. No wonder you are able to make meaningful connections with all who cross your path. I am speaking as a beneficiary of such an experience at Sam Sharp. Wow, wow, wow. Linda well, Richard, you make, you make my blood boil. <laughs> 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 this is, this is Listen, uh, as I was telling you the other day, it was going both ways. I was learning a lot from you all too. <laughs> I watched you and saw what worked and what didn't work. And what didn't work, I knew right away. Right. right. And I dropped it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So absolutely. I, a lot. Um, I can never forget the time when you invited me to California. Yes. To speak to the group. Jamaican Association of California. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Yes. And what I remembered was the impact that you had made on those people in that short space of time. Yes, yes. And which you have continued to do. And I want to congratulate you for the diaspora work and for your colleagues. Don't drop it. Take the button and run your leg. <laughs> yes. And when you are going to pass it on, say to the running ahead of you, take. Take it. Go. <laughs> and run the bend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you're well, all very, very proud of what you have done. Well, I, I, I am also very proud of, of something that I'm, I'm seeing. There is a picture here of an, um, it's uh, handing over a certificate to one of your ancillary staff. Oh. And, <laughs> and, and that's impactful because. I, I will, let me let you tell me about that program. Uh, let me let you tell me about that program and, and how they got it. Okay. I always felt that there's no distinction. We shouldn't treat people differently. If you're on Stillery, Coca, whatever. And we had a number of this stuff. I learned a lot from, you see this man standing there, Mr. Thompson, you remember him? Yes. I, I used to push the lawnmower outside with him. I learned from Mr. T. Yes, Mr. And T. We yes. have some serious conversations, Mr. T and Mr. Ellis. And what really happened was I thought I would start a program in psychology and child development from for the members of my ancillary staff. Because I used to say to them, guys, I know you some of your work, they, they would finish your work at about nine o'clock, and you wouldn't come back until about two hours afterwards. If there's any class that you like to go into and listen, just make the arrangements first with the lecturer. It didn't happen very often because it was not but one or two going to that class, but it wasn't happening. I thought what I would do is run a special program. So we had this special program with our ancillary workers and um, we taught them child psych They didn't want any child development. They love the word psychology. <laughs> they psychology. Come on now, you're joking. <laughs> And I remember one of them said, why you did not start this early enough? Mr. Thompson said, and I learned now, Mr. Ellis, I wish I had got this training when my daughter was so much, several years afterwards, you know? 
Yeah. If you come back to the picture, what you will see, that gentleman handing over the certificate, this was a graduation in the multipurpose hall. Right. All the members of the staff, the cooks, the cleaners, the groundsmen, bring it back, please, if we can bring it back. Bring back the picture for me, please. Yeah, I, um, yeah. So, so they go through a training program, and you give them, you give them a certificate. Uh, of of course, and got, it, and got a certificate. And that gentleman doing it was professor of adult education of the University of Ghana. I hope Dr. Mighty is looking because she must know him very well. I think he was a good friend of your of her father. Okay. And Reverend Agar, who was then permanent secretary, I think, in the Ministry of Education. I can't remember. Okay, but okay. that that was Professor Small who came up to, from Ghana to the graduation for that, the for that event. of our ancillary staff. Wow! Did, 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 did you see that program um, extending to any other the camp, campuses across the island? No, I, I, I didn't see. It. I, I, I didn't see it going on. You mm. had to. It, it was a great challenge with time. Sometimes a great challenge, but mm. it's something that I remain in at that level. I, but I tried to introduce it when I went to other countries on behalf of UNESCO. Mm -hmm. The people who work with you are also your clients for training. Find a program and provide it for them. Wow, that's really, really nice. That's that's yeah. super. I um I, I remember Mr. Thompson. I remember him and I remember Mr. Ellis really, really, really both, good too. They both came from Granville. Yes, yes, yes. Um uh, there's 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 a gentle a couple of people that I want to talk to you about. I'm I'm actually saving them for last, <laughs> but I, I I want to remind the the general public of the impact that you you have. You're not just trying to look at any one person uh, at any one seg or one segment of of people. You you go right across, and I, I remember being in a class with Ixwell Douglas, Doctor. Well, no, Doctor, Doctor Ixwell Douglas, and also Doctor uh, Cedric Fletcher. Yes. And I, I remember I recalled um, I spoke with a young lady this week. Her name is Faithy, and Faithy is deaf, and you brought her on campus. She actually taught her daughter how to. How to read lips and how to how to um, sign and all of that stuff, but it, it is it was so important because a lot of people don't know that you were the first to introduce this this type of um, learning or opportunity for people who are who are otherwise um, uh, abled. Uh, Ixwell was blind. Uh, Cedric was semi-blind that when he came into college and 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 faith it deaf and i know that you went through a hell trying to get the um the, the the board of education to to get you get this thing going dr clark are you there he's frozen i think we lost him again <laughs> No man, this this can't happen two weeks in a row. <laughs> yes, but yeah, yes. Until 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 he comes back in, I hope that he comes back in. Uh, you know, Doctor Clark gave opportunities to people. Okay. Oh, there he is. So I decided I was going to take the bull by the horns. You gotta you gotta start again because I think we. I know that you heard me, so you gotta start again, Doctor Clark. Yeah. Okay. I always believe that those of us in education should have, um, are you hearing me now? Yes, I'm hearing you now, I'm hearing you, yes. Yeah, you should become proficient in providing education for people who have special needs. When Cedric, uh, Cedric Fletcher and Hicksville Douglas came, these were young men who were seriously visually challenged. I didn't know anything about education for the blind, but I thought I would try it. So I admitted them. And the first thing I did was <laughs> I called the school for the blind and man in Hill Road in Kingston and said, look, I need to come because you guys need to help me. Mm. And I came up there. 
and they, I, I made friends with a lot of them and they helped me a great deal because that coming back to Montego Bay at Sam Shop, I could easily call them. And so I think he's having some um, challenges with his internet. It's unfortunate because uh, we're getting into this, uh, that part of it. That's really, really cute. Um, Dr. Clark? Dr. Clark? I remember the joint board when I told them we have to register them now. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. You went to the joint board and you have to register them. Go ahead. And they were concerned about how they were going to evaluate and I could understand. But a lot of information that I gained from the school for the blind, I was able to pass on to them. And so it was all right. And so we admitted these two young men. And you know the story. Hicksell got his PhD in finally from the University of the West Indies. And Cedric Fletcher got his PhD from what university again? You know, I. You're in Pennsylvania. But let, let, let me say this. Um, it, it, it's not just the PhD. When he left and went to UE, um, Ixwell led his class at the at the at the undergraduate. Right, he was he did, the yeah. right, and then when he did his masters, same thing. Okay, he was ahead of his class, and and so, uh, you know, it's it's so, you know, for you to be able to pick out these these guys from, you know. Not because Ixwell told me the story about him not being able to complete school. He took his his common entrance, and because he didn't know that he was he was having visual challenges, he he, he didn't pass his common entrance, and and he was left for, for nothing. I mean, he didn't, you know, he, he, he didn't he didn't finish school. I don't think he finished school. But you saw something in him that was different, and did you so did you did with um. With, with with Cedric, but Cedric, I think, went to Calabar, right? I think you went to Calabar. But I remember. But what I'm saying is don't write off yourself or yeah. write off any of God's creation. You yeah. have no authority to do. You don't create them. You yeah. provide the thing. And several others. Look at, um, oh, when I look at some of the graduates of, say, Green Island, one boy named Miller from Marchstone, is now the chief medical officer and ear, nose, and throat specialist of the hospital. What the name of what hospital is it? Is it King, Queen something hospital in Bermuda? Oh. His, brother, his younger brother was qualified with a PhD in nuclear physics. In March, then, among that team of West Indian scholars who brought into the West Indies the first external beam education uh, radiation machine for the treatment of cancer. Wow. And I can call his name Dr. Colin Miller from again Marchtown. Came to Green Island. Are you going to tell me that you can't do it? That's why I always say to you guys, you can do it because I knew that. You can that. do it. You can do it. Absolutely. And I've, I've proven it over because how I, when you look at my own background, coming from Silver City, Silver in City, the Panama Canal Zone, where because of the color of my skin, I was supposed to be far below. To such an extent, I think I told you last time that the same possibility in which. Uh, John McCain was born, president against um, Barack Obama. We were yeah. born in the same hospital. In the, but I was born in the silver section mm -mm. because of the pigment of my skin. Hello. So I came out of a situation of disadvantage, a country that helped me, and the school, Jamaica, Calabar, and the church, the Baptist church, did a tremendous lot too. So I am just. It's like a relay system that I told you all. I am simply passing it on to the next runner. Mm. And like you, I think I have to run the bend. <laughs> and running the bend, you have to lift. 
knee lift and stride. Knee lift and stride. Knee lift and stride. <laughs> but you cannot deaccelerate. You have to run. It's like um, some time ago when Jamaica had broken the, is it, is it a four by one? Four by one hundred meter. Yes. Yeah, and I think it was a Safa was entering. Yeah, a Safa Bolt Clark. Yes. Bolt was handing over to. Asafa. Asafa said, take it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going to take it. He said, run, Safa. <laughs> and he obeyed him. He ran like he never ran. Oh, that was an awesome finish, boy. Did you see the, the form? Mm. <laughs> run. Uh, Life. That is yeah. all you do. You know, Jamaica star. Something very special about Jamaica. Never forget that. Don't yeah. accept no or can't as answers. Yes. Even with your kids or those people who work yeah. with you. You can you can transform things. You must believe that I proved it over and over with you. Look yeah. at you. Look a wonderful example. Guys who are looking at this thing, look at Leo Professor <laughs> Gilling. Look, look at him. <laughs> yes. Oh you my God. I, I know I know how you feel about Rex Nettleford and Arthur Wint. And I'm just gonna shut up from here and you can just go ahead and talk. Okay, well, Rex, I got to know quite well because he was an outstanding old boy of Cornwall College. And even though he left before my time, okay? But apart from that, I told you of my association with the Montego Bay Boys Club, which was down at Railway Lane. Ra Railway Lane. <laughs> and used, yes, and they used to meet in an old railway shed beyond the... Montego Bay Railway Station. I used to go down there every Tuesday night. But you know that people don't, didn't want to go to Railway Lane, right? To Railway Lane is not you're nowhere. Telling me, you're telling me. <laughs> I used to walk to Railway Lane. I know. <laughs> and you know, I used to go down there too. Howard Cook. Howard Cook, yeah. B.M. Alexander. Yeah. <laughs> you're gone again. And, and oh, yes. I knew Railway Lane very well. Yes. So, um, we are talking now about well, which of you want to hear from first? Um, Rex Nelford. Yes. He was a graduate of the Boys Club, you know, Revele. Oh. Got his scholarship to Cornwall College. Oh. But the Boys Club was his start. And he told me that story. Oh. And those were the days of of um, Mas Charlie, yeah. Charlie Agate's father, yeah. who ran that club. And way back years afterwards, when I'd gone there and did that some chat, Papa, uh, Papa Pavlovic came on afterwards. Yeah. And he represented the Rotary Club of Montego Bay. Yeah. So I got to know Rex even before I met him. And then when I got, by the time I got to, on campus now, he was about two years ahead of me because I told you I went on. He must have gone to university. When it must have been five years old, I went to the university. Of <laughs> okay. And then he suddenly heard that I came from Panama, but I'm very much interested in Trelawney and that my father came from Bongazil. And that's where I came from. I was born there. Mm. We met and we became good friends because of that connection. My father, and not only that, there's a place I gather in Bongazil right now called King Street. King Street. King Street, which my father named. Oh. The coronation of the king. <laughs> the queen was not yet crowned. And yeah. I gather it was some Cornwall College boy telling me, was it Dave Brown? I can't remember, telling me that they still call it to this day King Street. Oh, wow. King Street, my paternal family house was established and what is remains of it is still there. Oh. King Street. And a lot of the youngsters went to the Unity Primary School. Yes. With teacher Francis. <laughs> that turned out an extraordinary line of outstanding Jamaicans. Okay? But worse than that, later on now, the Institute of Jamaica appointed me as vice chairman of the board of the Institute of Jamaica in Kingston on East Street, but Rex was chairman of the board at the time. So I got to know him. <laughs> and, that's quite so funny already. and then later on, I was made 
chairman of the Junior Center of the Institute. And I was also made later on chairman of the Caribbean, the African Caribbean Institute of Jamaica. Did all of that. Wow. And it was a Rex connection. Okay, I see, I see. Because he knew my background, African Caribbean diaspora, and he thought I might have been helpful in bringing all of those experiences together. That's great. That's so great. That's that so was, great. That was great. What the other person you asked me about? Arthur again? Wint. Arthur Wint. Arthur Wint. Arthur, my great friend. Arthur was the first chairman of the Green Island School Board. There he is addressing yes. his students. And if you look right up front there, there's a fellow called Jasper Brown who came to Sam Sharp after. Jasper Brown. The guy who's back, the head back we're looking. Yes. Went down and did medicine and is now an outstanding doctor in Mandeville. His oh, name is wow. Batman, but he was with us. Okay. Arthur was an extraordinary person. In World War II, he was a fighter pilot, did very well, is not shot down. I never asked him if he shot down any, but at the end of the war, he was still alive. Ah. Uh. And at the end of the war, the external, what you call them now, the RXRAF, Royal Air Force people, were allowed to pursue their further education. Arthur decided to do the one of the love of his life, to go to medical school, but he went to medical school late. He was one of the oldest, he was telling me, of his class. Mm. And so he qualified as a doctor and came back to Jamaica, worked at KPH different places. But where he did some of his most outstanding work was at the Noel Holmes uh, Hospital in Lucy. And it's very close, of course, it's very close to Green Island, you know. And he used to run clinics in Green Island. So he would pass by the school almost every afternoon. And so for, he developed this great interest in the school and great interest in promoting athletics. But he was an extraordinary human being, very humble. You would always meet him on a Friday evening at the, there was a club at the Gill Club, what they call it? Was it a Gill Club? Can't remember the name of the club. Playing dominoes with the guys. Mm. Up to when I was leaving to come to Sam Shah. <laughs> mm. Very humble, never. And the thing that I learned, a very outstanding person never gets it to his head. Anytime you say it about it, strutting about like a cock chicken watcher. It's, mm. it's not very much of anything. But anybody you see can be a king and walk with the commoner. That's the guy, or that's the young lady. Yes. I would, I would, I would appreciate oh, that. Okay. Arthur was in, Arthur was in, 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 an, in an effort to wrap up, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do something. Because every student who, had, who has passed through you um, learns or learned uh, you can do it. It's like the it's like uh, the the Nike the Nike um, uh, word. What what's Nike say again? Do do it or something like that. We 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 went through for for those years, and everyone that I meet these days who who had you as their their principal. The first thing that they will say to me is, you can do it. What does that mean to the general public? This. To the general public, just wind that up in a, in, in a great nutshell for me. You have as much time. Let me tell you, as I mentioned, all of us are born with an extraordinary capacity for excellence, not least founding many of us, many things. Who made us? God made us. And if you say God is the greatest and he made you, you got to be great. So don't tell me that the greatest who made you saying him can't do it or she cannot do it. You can do it. And in my own life, if you follow my thing, when I, the progress that I made, it wasn't possible for me to make this under normal circumstances. When I joined UNESCO after leaving Sam Shabbat, that late stage, I became a senior officer of UNESCO as the as a um, senior director or whatever it is for education, you know. I never had any further admission, but then other things began to happen. 
And I said, if another human being can do it, why can't I do it? And then finally, I became a director of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. As I said, you, you saw me on the AIDS International Board. I had, had no technical expertise, but I shared what I had about me was the creator who put in me a capacity to observe and to communicate. And so never you do this. I, I can never forget. And I'm sure she's listening now. I'm not going to call her name because I wanted to talk to me. <laughs> one morning, one Saturday morning, coming down from my office, I'm going over in the front of the purpose hall to talk to Metro. I saw this lady with a grip and two bags. <laughs> I asked her, where are you going? I'm going home, sir. Why are you going home? Can't, I can't make it. I can't make it. I can't, I can't do this anymore. I said, what? And after my finish, I said, don't tell me you can't do this. What can I do? This? I said, you take your things and go straight back down to the room. Oh, my God. She told me she went back down to that room. And after I said, you can do it, she never turned back. You all know her. She's watching now. And I'm <laughs> not going to tell you who she is. <laughs> and she has used that on many occasions to help other people. Oh. Don't put any negative stamp in yourself. You can do it. Uh, you can do it. Yes, man. You know something? I, um, it, has, it, has, it has brought me... Uh, to a, a lot of different platforms because I never thought that anything can stop me. I, I, I just, I know from my, from the day I left Sam Sharp, I never had a path for, for where I am. But every step that I take or took had some kind of tangent and I make my decisions to take this path and take that path. And it's not because of, I don't believe that anything can stop me other than my health <laughs> or my death. Because if I want to do something, I always tell myself from back then that I can do it. And that's probably because you put that in my head that I can do. You are, you are, you are the example of it right now. <laughs> but listen to, to wrap up. <laughs> Let me just tell you, I'm going to try and quote some lines written by John Donne. He was a great English poet, D-O-N-N-E, -N -N -E, of the 17th century. And this poem, I think, was called, you can look it out the words, The Resurrection or something like that. Mm. I'm going to give a little background to it. It was during the time when there was this conflict between the intellectual acceptance of the earth being round right. and the earth being flat or that the earth being at the center of the thing rather than God. Yes. And it created a lot of problems, but for me, it became very clear through that poem. And I'd like to leave this with you guys. From the round earth, remotest corners blow your trumpets ye archangels and arise arise from the dead ye numberless infinities of souls and to your scattered bodies go in other words what he was trying to do is combine the philosophic idea of the earth being round to the ptolemaic idea of the earth being flat Notice that around Earth, remotest corners, all kind of around thing of corners. But no corners. Mm -hmm. And he had a thing which he would be in his poetry. He was able to blend irreconcilable concepts through a methodology called wit, W-I-T. Witten was not mean clever, but meaning to see things from a different perspective. The round Earth's remotest corners blow your trumpets. And here it was that he was also introducing the concept of the resurrection during a time when the irreligious yes. philosophy was yes. rising. Yes. From the round earth, remotest corners, blow your trumpets, the archangels, and arise, arise from the dead, those who can't perceive. Ye numberless infinities of souls and to your scattered bodies go. Shake it up and be alive again, uh, be alive again because you can still do it. 
Oh, God. Thank you. Dr. Yes, sir. Simon, Dr. Simon Alonzo Clark, you gave us your all. And I so thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Thank you so much for putting yourself inside of this the way that you did because it couldn't be done any other way. Thank you so much for this. I, 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 I Oh my God, I revere just knowing you. Thank you. Well, the pleasure is mine and I don't think you will ever understand the admiration that I have for you and for all of your colleagues who helped to make me what I became. So thank, thank you. you very much. And all my fellows, fellow go there. Thank you. And hope to see you one day in Montigui Band. Probably if you come down when the crisis is over, I will take you sailing. Oh, no, and that's right. You win one of those races. Oh yes, I was. I got. I got one of those. <laughs> those boat rides. Oh, yes. I was. I did. I did. I, I. I want to go back sailing again. The craft C major is still there. <laughs> the uh, C major. C major. Okay, C major. All right. Take care. Bye bye. <laughs> Bye -bye. Still uh, thank you so much uh, for, for listening and we will see you again next week same place, same time, bye bye